So here's our super fast version of week eight, lecture number two, which is the nervous system. So here are the topics and our objectives. So the first thing to note about nervous systems is they allow for integration. And that is to say, various neurons can talk to each other. And this is because all those neurons are gonna have neurotransmitters turns out there's hundreds of interactions that exist, meaning if I were to draw a generic neuro or neuron, I'm going to have hundreds or potentially like one or two hundred different <coughs> neurons trying to interact and manipulate what's going on. So the question is, how do we know what's going to result from all this interaction? Well, there's two major methods of that integration. The first one is what we call spatial, and that is just the amount wins. This is, for the most part, what we observe. But we can also have temporal, meaning the timing or the frequency is what wins. And we see this in your senses. Ultimately, what we have to do once we have all this interaction is we have to get rid of those <coughs> um, neurotransmitters. And this can be done by degradation or uptake. With um, pathways, so neuron to neuron to neuron being asked to function, your brain will actually rewire itself to make new connections, and we call that plasticity. When we look at learning, we actually can tell the difference between short-term learning and long-term learning. So a short-term pathway will involve a couple of neurons, but then over time, they change their minds as to how they connect. But, so this would be short-term learning. But if we have long-term learning, what we would get instead, over time, is we reinforce the pathway. And we would do that by adding myelin to it, which is a way of committing to the step. And that's, and unfortunately that process takes a long time, which is why learning takes a while and you can't learn stuff instantaneously few people can but that's not normal we also can watch how this rewiring or this plasticity changes over time and as you get older you just start deleting parts that you don't need so if you practice and keep it around it stays it's the use it or lose it phenomenon when we look at your brain and looking at its plasticity and how it develops, it turns out the oldest parts of your nervous system are the first to show up. And the newer parts tend to be really sensitive to change, meaning the frontal lobe, which is the newest part of the brain, is the most sensitive. But without the older parts of your nervous system, you're in trouble. Evolutionarily, there's many types of nervous systems across all the animals. So we start with basic nerve nets, which are just coordination. But eventually we start to get ganglia. And the ganglia turn out to be just a collection of neurons. So it's a collection of neurons. And it usually forms like a little bulgy looking shape. And eventually we can call that a brain because it's a large set of ganglia. Brains tend to be found in a centralized area where there's lots of senses, which may or may not be a good battle plan, but it's a lot of processing in one spot. If we look at vertebrates, there's a pattern with brain evolution which is we get an increase in emphasis on the forebrain and a decreased emphasis on what we call the hindbrain. 
And it's not necessarily that one is becoming smaller and one's becoming bigger. It's actually this one is increasing in size and it makes the hindbrain look less. With vertebrates, we divide up our nervous system in two different ways. We can def divide it by how it's built. If that's the case, we have what we call the central nervous system, which is your brain and spinal cord. And then the peripheral would be all else, which is a nice way of saying nerves. But we also have this weird thing called the enteric system, and this would be for your intestines. It's a part of the peripheral, but it kind of does its own thing. Anatomy is easy because I can point and tell you where it is and what its name is, but it's really hard to tell you what it does. Physiologically, it's easy to say what things do. The somatic system is under conscious control. Whereas the autonomic is not under control. The catch is it's really hard to find the somatic and the autonomic. So we can define things by where what its name is, but what it does is hard, or we can define it by what it does, but finding it is hard. Go figure. A different way of viewing all of this stuff, and we'll go through it in a bit. So if I look at somatic function, meaning where we get to make decisions, a lot of this is going to focus around the brain, and the brain is divided into lobes. So when we look at the brain itself and ignore the lobes, and we also see this with the spinal cord, we're going to find a group of tissue that we call collectively gray matter. This is actually cell bodies. And so that's where all the somas from all the neurons would be found in this gray matter. We have it primarily in the cortex, which is the outside, but you could find little random spots on the inside. If it's on the inside, we call it a nucleus. So if you've heard of things like the basal nuclei, that's referencing a bunch of cell bodies within this brain. White matter are axons primarily, which is to say the wiring. When we look at the brain, we have the gray matter is on the outside and the white matter is on the inside. The spinal cord, it's the exact opposite. Gray matter is on the inside and the white matter is on the outside. There's a switch that occurs called a or decussation and it occurs within your brainstem. And it's a rather strange phenomenon why it occurs. Great question, don't know. I mean, I can come up with some reasons, but that's just me trying to rationalize it. In terms of brain anatomy, there are five major chunks. We have what we call the cerebrum, the diencephalon, midbrain, the cerebellum, and pons, and then the medulla. The forebrain is the cerebellum, or excuse me, the cerebrum and the diencephalon. Embryologically, we can give these fancy names like the telencephalon and the diencephalon, telen meaning the furthest part away. Midbrain is referred to as the mesencephalon. The hindbrain is called the meton and myelencephalon. Each of these turns out to have jobs. Hindbrain is the, quote, primitive brain but it's the part that's going to keep you alive. The forebrain is your personality and decision-making. It's also the most sensitive to change. If I look just at the cerebrum, we can see that it has a bunch of different lobes, like the frontal lobe, which is where decisions are made, the parietal lobe, which is associated with sensations, Occipital lobe processes visual cues. The temporal lobe is dealing with any type of auditory cues. There's also a chunk hidden on the inside called the insula. And that's really good with emotions and like pain and stuff like that. 
if I look right here in what we call the central sulcus, and in lab where we're going to talk about what a sulcus is versus a gyrus and versus a fissure and all that. If I look at the central sulcus, we have in front of it what we call the primary motor cortex, and behind it is the somatosensory or the sensory cortex. But this, these pictures here turn out to be are called homunculi, and they're showing us what parts of the cortex are associated with controlling your hand or your face or your tongue or basically the rest of your body. So you can see like there's a more devoted to your face than there is to like your trunk. Over here, this is how we receive sensations. So we can see like your face gets a lot of sensations. Your tongue gets its own set of sensations. You actually get some feeling from your organs. We get a lot of feeling from your hands, but like the rest of your body doesn't get too much. Feet have some and you know, genitals. Part of the way that we test out to see how your somatic function is going is we can use reflexes. Reflexes have five components, a receptor, a sensory neuron, an interneuron, which is a nice way of saying the processor. The afferent or sensory neuron connects these two. The efferent, but people say efferent or motor neuron is gonna connect the interneuron to the effector, which is always going to be a muscle or a gland. Usually reflexes turn out to be protective in nature, and they're usually resisting some type of stretch so that you don't stretch and tear muscles. So your, um, your patellar reflex, what you're doing is you're causing a stretch in your quadriceps muscle by hitting this tendon. And what that does is you have a sensor called a Golgi tendon, it's gonna send a signal out through a sensory neuron. It's gonna get processed in your spinal cord. There's the interneuron. We're gonna fire off what to do through the motor neuron. It's gonna innervate the muscles and you're gonna get a response, which is you're gonna kick out your knee. Autonomic function is actually a little bit harder because you don't get any control in it. You can do some tricks to control it like meditation and controlling your breathing, but you don't get conscious control. You can't say dilate my pupils or I need to speed up my heart rate, but you can meant, you can think of things and behaviorally change stuff, but you don't get to just think it and then it does it. Autonomic function, it has two main divisions, what we call the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. The sympathetic is found on its own little chain called the sympathetic chain or the sympathetic ganglia and there's two of them and they're parallel to your spinal cord they're composed of two different neurons so we have to go from cns to the sympathetic chain so that's going to be one neuron and then this is going to send a, ner a nerve out or neuron out, and that would be the second neuron. They are collectively involved with what we call fight or flight responses. So when you look at it, if you just think of being nervous or being scared, everything that you think of going on in you, that's sympathetic. It is compared with the parasympathetic, which primarily comes from cranial nerves. So the cranial nerves turn out to be the ocular motor, the facial, um, the glossopharyngeal, and the vagus nerve, and then also some sacral nerves. So here it doesn't have its own system, but it's composed of other nerves that already exist. It's what we call rest and digest. So think about after Thanksgiving. Or after all you can eat, fill in the blank, where you do your best to do all you can eat. These are also two neuron systems, but they turn out to have ganglia near organs and you don't really notice them. Which one is good, sympathetic or parasympathetic? Turns out you need both. Too much of one is not good. You need both in order to have normal function. 
So next time we're going to deal with motor control and that's going to be the end of the second exam.